we're on the last topic. It's based on the book I co-authored with Elise Fitzpatrick called You Never Stop Being a Parent. And this title I got to pick. <laughs> and it actually came out of something where about 20 years ago when we still had our kids at home, for the most part, and I gave a talk on parenting, I think in a sermon, like in Ephesians or something, I made some say, yeah, and when your kids are grown and they're out of the house, then you're done. <laughs> okay, you're laughing. Uh, I didn't know how silly it was that I said, but this man who's a retired missionary named Elmer came up to me, and he put his arm around me and said, Jim, you never stop being a parent. And at that time, Elmer might have been in his mid-60s. And um, thinking about it, Elmer had a daughter living near him, and he was very involved in, actually two daughters living near him and was involved with them and their families and the struggles they had. He was living in Southern California, had a son living in North Carolina who injured himself, and Elmer went and helped the son run his business while uh, he recovered physically from a significant injury. And uh, no, you, you're right, you never do stop being a parent. Uh, there was a newspaper article not long after that in our local little newspaper in Escondido, about a lady who celebrated her 105th, 105th birthday. And it said in the article, she remains extremely close to her kids, 74 and 75. <laughs> she said, well, they're not kids anymore, but they are to me. And as I've already told you, I have kids who are 29, 33, 36. Um, it's true. And what actually got this project going was that, okay, a couple of things. One is that in counseling, I found that I had so many couples coming in, and sometimes young adults, where there was big problems between parents and their adult kids. One would be adult kids in their mid-20s into their 30s living at home and doing nothing with their lives. And the parents didn't know what to do with these kids. Sometimes it'd be they'd get in big trouble and drugs, alcohol, crime, and they didn't know what to do about that. Uh, there were cases of parents with kids where it'd be the adult kid, and here's a girl who's 22 years old. She met a guy at a Christian college. They want to get married, and her parents don't want her to marry him. And they said that they have the authority to tell her who to marry and conflict like that. So you had all these issues coming up, and... As you consider, like, on the bookshelf, I used to say, well, if you go into a Christian bookstore, I don't think there are any more Christian bookstores. You go online, and there are lots of books about parenting little kids. There are a handful of books about parenting teenagers, and there's virtually nothing, especially biblical, about parenting, the relationship between parents and their adult kids. And so, in addition to what we were learning as we were counseling people in these situations, we also, I really started thinking deliberately in Scripture. We, we teach the Bible is sufficient. It's not just sufficient to teach you how to train your five-year-old. It's sufficient to tell you how to get along with your 25-year-old or your 45-year-old. And actually, what amazed me is I studied the Scriptures more. There's a lot in the Bible very specifically about parents and their adult kids and those relationships um, and also there are principles in the Bible, of course, that apply to every situation and question we may encounter. Now, the book is 200 and something pages long. Your outline has more material in it than I'm going to be able to cover now, so don't get alarmed if I'm jumping over big parts. Some of it also is, some of this I've already touched upon a little bit in the other talks, and I want to focus on the parts that are unique to this and maybe even opened up to answer some questions. Um, so preparing your child for adulthood is part of what uh, you're thinking about. This is the thing, ideally, you're thinking about kind of from the time you know you're expecting. Uh, I think I did have confirmed there are at least one or two women around who are pregnant. And, you know, you start praying for your child, who they're going to marry, how they're going to be. But you realize, unlike marriage, which is until death parts you, uh, parenting is something that is, has a temporary aspect to it. I mean, you're always a parent in one sense, but in terms of, uh, they're going to come into your home totally dependent upon you and almost completely under your control. And over time, they're going to become less dependent and less under control. And then one day, hopefully, they will leave. And it'll be completely out of your control. 
And to keep in mind throughout the parenting process that you know, the marriage relationship, you mean, children leave father and mother, father and mother stay together till death parts them. And we as parents want to equip our kids to be ready for adulthood. And that's a big part of what Proverbs is all about, really. I mean, if you want a manual for training your kids to be adults, the book of Proverbs, both in its general and in its specific exhortations, is that manual. Uh, prepare them to live wisely with their money, with their relationships, with their sexuality. Um, and so that, that's our job. And I've got a list in the notes and in the book about you know, all the things you want to do. It's, it's the thing Proverbs does, preparing them to, for vocation, for financial wisdom. Uh, and then another aspect of this is, part of being prepared for that is, as they become adults, prepare to relate to them as adults and begin relating to them as adults. And, and this is kind of a funny thing, like if it's, I meet people, I teach people, I actually have colleagues who are the age of my son who I'm going to see, Lord willing, tomorrow or the next day. And yet the colleagues I, who are in their mid-30s, I look at them as peers, even though I'm 20-something years older than they are. But my son, I still kind of think of him as about 17. And other people will look at your kids as they become adults, even into their late teens and early 20s, and they're seeing them as adults. And you still are picturing diaper changes and first day of school, whatever else. And so one of the challenges is to, to recognize is the relationship is changing. One is, is that your relationship is changing from control to influence. You want to have influence, but you're only going to have as much influence as they let you have when they become adults. And so you're trying to win them and, and win relationship. And also the nature of the relationship is changing where, and this can be very delightful, but you, you relate as equal adults in a sense as they become adults. And that's not something that just boom happens on their 18th birthday, their 21st birthday or on their wedding day. And it's something you have to work at really hard because it, it doesn't come naturally. Uh, one of the biggest you know, we did a, some surveys of parents and their adult kids, and one of the biggest problems we've seen is that the, the kids will complain, I'm 23 years old, I've got a job, and my mother still treats me like I'm seven. Uh, or even when they're living in the home and there's, there's nagging, or they're not in the home. And they're living, you know, example would be, your 23-year-old daughter is living with her boyfriend in some apartment in some other town, and every time she's on the phone, you want to give her a speech about morality and fornication. I tell parents to ask this question. Does she already know what you think about this? <laughs> Almost certain. It's not going to help to repeat that information to her. It's probably going to damage the relationship for you to keep over and over again saying what she already knows. Um, and it's, it's going to push her away. So don't nag. Uh, try to work at affirming what you can. And then, you know, while they're still in the home, you're trying to prepare them for that. Uh, I do find that you see some cases where kids will leave too soon. Sometimes it's their own rebellion, where and I, I felt like this when my son was 19 and he kind of declared his independence. I, I wrote him and said, ideally, we'd wait a few years for this. <laughs> I don't think you're quite ready for what you're jumping into. Um, some kids, just, again, the irony sometimes would be, what does what an 18-year-old young man do if he doesn't want to be told what to do by his parents anymore? He joins the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> and what does a 20-year-old girl do if she doesn't want to be told what to do anymore? She marries the Marine two years later. <laughs> And then they just have to learn. Um, so sometimes they want to get away before they're ready. Sometimes the parents are so angry, controlling, immature, selfish. They're so much provoking their kids to anger. They're driving their kids out. And the parents have a lot of blame for that. I saw one large family where the dad was just an angry, controlling man who wouldn't listen to anybody, claimed to be a Christian, but would never... Joined a church, he was just mad at elders, mad at the government, mad at his kids, mad at his wife. And as soon as those kids could find a way out of that house, as they became teenagers, late teenagers, they escaped. And that wasn't because they were awful rebels like he thought. 
Uh, he had a lot to blame there. Uh, but then question, and this is a, a really big one. Even if we mentioned Bill Gothard, some people were talking about that. I remember being at one of the Bill Gothard seminars where he basically said that you're under the authority of your parents until you get married. And is that what the Bible says? And my understanding is the Bible teaches that when your children become adults, the relationship changes. Uh, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I become a man. I put away childish things. And my belief is one of the greatest mistakes that Christian parents make to provoke their adult kids to anger and destroy relationships is they continue to treat 27-year-olds like they're 17 and 19-year-olds like they're 9, and they will not respect the adulthood of their children. Now, it's easy from Genesis 2.24, for this reason a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, so they get married and they're, you know, independent. Although I've even been in, I've met families where there was kind of this patriarchy established where you had the father who still expected his married kids to more or less be under his authority. That's clearly unbiblical. But what about single adults? Do they still have to obey their parents? And I had a real case, a guy named, I'll call Jorge, and he was 42 years old living with his mother. And his mother had been abandoned by her husband many years earlier. And uh, their, his, Jorge's brother had gotten married and had kids and had moved off to another state. And Jorge had fallen in love. And Jorge had brought this girl. He'd, actually, he had been kind of courting this girl for several years. But he was not marrying her. Actually, his mother had forbidden him from ever seeing her again was preventing the marriage and came to seek my advice. And this girl was amazing. The only thing wrong with her is she was putting up with Jorge, quite frankly, right? Um, if I'd been her dad, I'd say, get, you know, get rid of this guy is my advice to you. But um, she was a sweet, humble, godly gal. But the mom said, the Bible says, honor your father and mother, children obey your parents. And I don't care if you're 42 years old, I'm telling you not to marry her. I hate this girl. Well, the reason she hated that girl is because she wanted Jorge to take care of her and didn't want Jorge to leave the house. And um, I tried to convince, and I did finally convince Jorge from the Bible, that he as an adult is of age and has the freedom to make his choices as an adult and is not under his mother's authority. We are to honor our parents even when we are adults. My mom is 81 years old. My in-laws are in their mid-80s. We still honor them. But we are no longer responsible to obey them. And if my wife were to pass away, that would still be true. Um, there, I think there's scriptural evidence for this. I'm going to give you a couple of brief examples. Because you may run into people who went to a seminar and heard this. And I remember hearing Gothard give an example of some young adult whose parents wouldn't give permission and just, well, you can't marry. And um, I don't believe that to be biblical. John, interesting, in John 9... It's the man born blind. And the Jews, when they're upset about this man born blind seeing, uh, verse 18 says, The Jews did not believe it of him that he had been blind and received sight until they called the parents of the one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How now does he see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Get it? So he had reached an age in adulthood, even though he was probably somewhat dependent as a blind son. He says, there, a time comes when you're of age where you now speak for yourself and your parents no longer speak for you. Uh, another passage that was pointed out to me is Numbers 32.11. And another kind of unusual place to look. But this is when the spies went to the land of Canaan, and you had Joshua and Caleb who were believing, and you had the ten unbelieving spies. And here's the question. You're 25 years old. You're living in the tent next to your parents. You're not married yet. The, the spies come, and your parents say, we're with the ten who aren't believing, what should you do? Should you honor your parents and line up with them with the unbelieving spies? 
Or should you follow Joshua and Caleb? Well, there's just a little snippet of data. It says in verse 11, None of the men who came up out of Egypt, the Lord speaking, from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swore, where I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, for they did not follow me fully. So the Lord is saying, I don't care. You, you pick the age of 20, but he said, those 20 and above were responsible to follow after Joshua and Caleb no matter what their parents did. Uh, so that's, that's another inference. Uh, a couple of the places I would go in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about the single person. He says, it's nice if you can be single, but what is the purpose of singleness? Again, another example, I had a fellow in our church who was from another country and he was courting a girl back in his home country and they love each other, they wanted to get married, but her parents did not want her to leave. She was in her 30s. And they did not want her to leave them. They wanted her to stay and take care of them. And this was a real struggle. And in her case, she, even though she wanted to marry the guy, she chose to do what her parents said. She was free to make that choice, but she didn't have to make that choice, as I understand it. And you look at what Paul says the purpose of singleness is, in verse, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verse 32, I want you to be free from concern. The one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be both holy in body and spirit. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. But, but here's the point in 1 Corinthians 7, is you're making the decision whether or not to be married. It's not a choice between living with your parents and taking care of them and getting married. There's a vision of the single life that's independent. You're, you're an adult. And you're going to, in your adulthood, serve the Lord. I'm sure a lot of these people are from unsaved families. And this is an issue that actually comes up, where someone out of a Muslim family is converted. Their, their family's never going to agree with the decisions they make in life. But as adults, they have the freedom to make those decisions. Um, now, if your child is under your roof, uh, as an adult, you do have the right to have expectations. But there, it's under a mutually voluntary relationship. A minor child is under your authority, under your roof, and they've got to follow your rules. A child who's an adult, you've got... Basically, a mutual agreement is that you can live here so long as you meet these expectations. And if you don't meet the expectations, you're free to go at any time. I can't make you stay, nor would I want to. Um, and, and he has the same choice where he's saying, you know, based on whatever I'm being offered to live here, I will accept or I will not accept. But it's a, it's a, mutual, it's a, a mutual agreement as opposed to an authority relationship. But even if you were living with some other family or you were living with roommates, there'd be expectations, right? You pay your rent on time. You don't leave your stuff all over the place. You don't take other people's food out of the refrigerator. You, you, know, you live decently. You don't make noise in the middle of the night. So um, there are expectations, but even then, it's, they're always free to go. So next major topic is, well, what, what then do you do in that situation where you have this young adult. And this is something that it's been now several years. There was actually an article in Time Magazine several years ago called The Twixters, the 18 to 29 year olds, now maybe the 18 to 39 year olds, uh, putting off adult responsibility, living at home, not getting married, not even developing a career. And uh, there, there are different titles for that. Uh, some call it the Peter Pan syndrome. I never want to grow up. Uh, the British call them kippers, kids and parents' pockets eroding retirement savings. Um, so it's not limited to our country. Um, the Australians call them boomerang kids. You throw them out and they keep coming back. But a problem in many situations is you have young adults who want all the privileges and freedoms of adulthood with none of the responsibilities. And their parents have spent 30 years of marriage developing the lifestyle they have and working hard in their careers and doing what Proverbs says about work and saving and responsibility. And the kids want to be able to enjoy that lifestyle with none of the effort. And it's not good for anybody. And often it's the, largely the parents' fault because they become enablers of sin. 
Uh, now, there are valid reasons for a young adult to live at home. There are many possible, I'm not saying go home and kick them out <laughs> this afternoon in all cases, but, you know, your child is completing his degree in education or establishing a career, uh, even saving up for a house or marriage in the future, but they're, they're living responsibly or just your, your daughter wants to live at home while she, with her parents, again, working hard, busy in life, but not yet married. Um, you have kids who are disabled. There are over three million children with disabilities living with their parents. You know, autism, severely autistic, Down syndrome, other problems where they can't be independent. And then sometimes it is the other way around where children stay in the home as caretakers in extraordinary circumstances. Or, you know, the husband's off in a year's deployment and the wife stays with her folks or his folks during that time. You know, you know, the spouse has abandoned the wife and the kids and the parents take her in. So, I mean, there are extraordinary circumstances. But the bad situation is when you have young adults who are postponing adulthood. And so they're not getting into a career. Uh, they aren't moving ahead in their education. And just what I saw in Southern California, you had these people in their mid-20s who would sign up for a few courses at the community college and drop two of the three before the semester was over. They'd work part-time just enough to pay their phone bill, their Starbucks, and, but they're getting nowhere in life. They're hanging out with their friends. Um, and there's so much in Proverbs. You know, the he who tills his land will have plenty of food. The, the one who follows empty pursuits will have poverty in plenty. Uh, college stretched out over a decade even still can't make up their minds what they want to be when they grow up, if they grow up, uh, trying to find kind of an easy way to make money, not recognizing. And the Bible says hard work with skill produces wealth. Uh, you know, go to the Anto sluggard, and you, know, you see a man skilled in his work, he'll stand before kings. He won't uh, serve ordinary men. That you, the way you make a lot of money, the way you make enough money to get by, the way you can afford a house in California is you develop a very valuable skill, not a minimum wage uh, barista or something. Um, but then again, so then they expect their parents and others to take care of them. They, they, they expect, you know, hey, you've got money, why shouldn't you help me? I, I would help you if you needed money, I guess. And, but the parents, by doing this, the Proverbs says, is it uh, 1626, a worker's appetite works for him, for his hunger urges him on. And, and the very thing that would drive a person to say, you know, I, I better get some skill and get a job, or, you know, I'm, I'm making $9 an hour, and rather than protesting about it, get some skill where they're competing to hire you for $20 an hour because you're so good at it. Um, often they are in debt, Often they take nicer vacations and have nicer phones and TVs than their parents, even though they're living at home, because the parents are paying mortgage, utilities, and other necessities. Um, and then it's usually accompanied by immoral relationships, either pornography or fornication. Uh, marriage is postponed, and there's been secular studies done about how men become much more productive and high earning when they're married than when they're single. Again, then parents, uh, they haven't prepared or insisted that their kids become independent. Uh, sometimes also, if you've had kind of a rough time in their teens, they, they're kind of nice to have around in the sense that they're friendly. They, maybe they know they don't want to you know, trouble the waters too much. And, and sometimes the parents are a little bit afraid. What are we going to do if he does leave? It'd just be the two of us. And that's kind of scary. Um, <laughs> They bail them out when they get in trouble financially, debt, fines. Um, and they're afraid to take strong steps to deal with their kids. And I've, I've, just, I've presented this material like in multiple countries. They say, well, no, in our culture, we could never tell our kids to leave the house. Well, 1 Samuel 2.29, I think I referenced it before but it's one of my favorite parenting verses. Eli is the classic failed parent, and Eli's children were young adults. They were doing all kinds of evil, um, 
in their role. They were stealing, they were blaspheming the sacrifices, they were guilty of immorality. And Eli whines at them, you know, he complains about them, but he doesn't do anything. And the Lord says in 1 Samuel 2.29, you honor your sons above me. That was the great sin of Eli, is that he was afraid to upset his sons and so he dishonored God to keep the sons happy. And that sin is probably the great sin of parents of adult kids. Is if you know, and you're convinced from the Bible what you ought to be doing, and you're not doing it because you're afraid of upsetting your relationship with your adult kids, you are being Eli. And don't, again, Eli nagged his children. <laughs> he, oh my sons, it is not good, the thing I hear. He, he whined at them. But he never actually did anything to them. And finally, judgment came upon not just them, but him also. He didn't really solve anything by his avoidance. And many, many parents are afraid to take action, to kick them out of the nest. Um, now, even when things are going well, it can be challenging. And parents can go the other way. It, 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 it's difficult. The, the child wants to be respected as an adult. The parents have a hard time adjusting. I remember when we were in our 20s, we were living abroad, and I got two months a year off. We were living in Saudi Arabia, and we'd spend a lot of that time with our parents. And I remember after about a week, and I had a wife and kids, but my, my, our parents would still kind of revert to our childhood, and I learned I didn't want to spend a month with my in-laws and a month with my parents in a year. Um, so there, there's stress on all sides, but you know, there need to be expectations that are reasonable, age appropriate, um, and then do what you can. And again, some situations are going great. I'm not saying go home, kick them out. I'm not saying go home and make a written contract. But if things aren't going well, then expectations need to be established and made clear. I, and there need to be consequences. Um, in some cases, there are contract. Your things aren't going well. And if you're going to stay here, this is what we're going to expect. And then you're, we're not going to kick you out. You're going to make your own choice. If you meet the expectations, you're staying. And if you're refusing to meet the expectations, that's conveying to me you've made the decision to leave. Uh, among the expectations, one of the most important is to be busy working hard. That would be financial responsibility. Uh, don't pay for their stuff they should be paying for by now. And then don't allow them to be lazy. Um, my statement to parents would be, your 20-something-year-old who's living with you should be working just as hard as the adults who are working so that he has a place to live. Does that make sense? By the way, how many hours a week does the typical 50-year-old parent work to keep the household running? Just 40 hours? No, I mean, you're 50 something hours just going to work, getting to work, being at work and coming home. And then when you go home, there's no more work to do, right? <laughs> no, only then there's laundry and food and cleaning and yard and all this stuff. And so again, you want to be treated as an equal adult. You need to work as hard as we work. We're, we're not running a situation where you, the, the, this extended senior year, summer after senior year of high school thing you're trying to do to us. If you're going to live here, you have to establish that you're working as hard as we're working or you can't stay here. Again, you make the decision, but these are the conditions. Um, there should be sexual purity, pornography, uh, fornication, substance abuse. But then there has to be a cost. Remember Proverbs 26.3, a bit for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of a fool. Um, to take the analogy of the donkey if you have a donkey and you're trying to get the donkey to pull the cart up the hill and the donkey doesn't want to do it if you go mr donkey it just makes me feel so sad when you don't do what i ask you to do it just breaks my heart i can't sleep at night i'm just so miserable does mr donkey care he doesn't care one bit and your children are smarter than mr donkey they realize they've got you they use that to manipulate you what does mr donkey understand SWAT, right? Uh, someone who, if, if your child is wise, they don't need this, what I'm talking about. But if your child is a lazy, foolish person, then if wisdom will not persuade them, consequences will, is what the proverb is saying. Consequence is you've got two weeks to get out, or 
You have to keep a chart proving to me you're putting in 55 hours a week of productive labor. That could be school. It could be volunteering. It could be employment. We can all agree on whatever that would be. But you must do that. And I had one situation where I said, okay, we're going to have this baseline of 50 hours a week. And you give, this guy had, the kid was making good money in his job. So you've got to give me $10 an hour for every hour you're below the threshold. Now, some of them are broke because they're lazy and that won't work with them. Uh, I have another financial example. Where I had a friend who had his 20-something-year-old son, hardworking guy, making lots of money, living at home. But my friend would come down and, well, first of all, the, the, the son would come in at 12.30 at night, slamming doors. And, you know, my friend who goes to bed at 9.30 is awakened by this. And then my friend comes downstairs and all the lights are on and, you know, front doors left unlocked. And so then my friend would go into the room at 7 and I'm like, oh, you irresponsible. You know, wake up the guy who's only been asleep for a few hours. Wasn't working very well. So my friend implemented a policy where... If you wake us up, that'll be 20 bucks. And if the lights are on, that'll be 10 bucks. If the door's unlocked, that'll be 30 bucks. No more discussion. Guess how much money my friend collected? Good guess. But there needs to be, again, scolding and nagging is destructive to relationships and it doesn't improve behavior. Have you figured that out already? Um, but there have to be consequences. One question people ask is, do you make them come to church? And my answer is, I cannot tell you from the Bible what to do. It's your house. And if you want to tell your 25-year-old a condition of living in your house is coming to church for one service a week, I can't tell you you can't do that. But I can't tell you from the Bible you have to do that. There's nothing in the Bible that says non-Christians must come to church. Um, and so we reached a point when our kids became legally adults where we reached the conclusion that they've been listening to this for 18 years, they know what they're going to hear, and making them come against their will as a condition of eating and sleeping in our house probably won't be beneficial. So we're going to leave it up to them. And then often they were coming anyway. But that's, I'm not saying that's the law for all people, but that's the conclusion we came to. Other people will say, as part of our house, you need to participate in it. That's your choice. But the Bible doesn't mandate this, which would be my point. And then, Ultimately, uh, you know, there are other conditions you can make in terms of drug testing, financial accountability. If your child is living at home because they've been grossly irresponsible and they're overwhelmed with debt, you can say, if you're going to live here, you're going to be accountable for a budget. And, or if you're here because of alcohol and other substance abuse, uh, we're going to keep you accountable for your time and your money and drug test you if necessary. And it, well, this is an intrusion upon my adulthood. Great. Find a better deal and take it. <laughs> you know, if you can find somebody who's willing to offer you a better deal than our deal, you'd be there already. And we're not even, we don't think this is going to be fun to do this. It's because we love you. We're not giving up on you. Um, which kind of is a transition to the next point. When, you, when your adult kids are in trouble, we've already gone through why that happens. Um, just bailing them out is not going to solve things. And it could be they keep getting into debt, they... Oh, I've seen this happen where, well, I can't pay my car insurance. And if I can't pay my car insurance, I can't go to school. I can't go to work. I know you want me to go to school and go to work, so you need to give me the money. Well, you know, it's stepping back a few steps. Okay, why don't you have the money? Well, you went skiing last weekend. You ate out five times last week, and you picked up the tab for your friends. Therefore, I have to pay for your car insurance. And you know, I've had a similar thing where a girl says, well, my friends are going to Las Vegas, wedding, girls thing, and I need $800 to do this. Well, a lot of Proverbs about planning, saving, and the, the whole, you know, the principle of you lose when you don't plan and prepare. And so heaven forbid that she should have to go without because of her irresponsibility. Um, but parents often give in because they're manipulated. They're, again, they're fearful. Back to 1 Samuel 2.29. They're more afraid of their kids being mad at them than they're afraid of God being mad at them. And uh, it can help to seek counsel. But don't be an enabler like Eli was. Eli should have fired those kids from the priest business, right? He was overseeing them. It's an unusual situation in, for a family, but he, as the priest in Israel, 
should not have allowed. He knew what his sons were doing with the women and the offerings and the stealing and the, the blasphemy. And he let it keep going on. As the Lord says, you've honored your sons above me. Again, back to the prodigal son. When did he come home? When he was hungry. When he was experiencing the consequences of his folly. And uh, many wayward kids have an entitlement mentality. They can be extraordinarily manipulative. If you're going to help, do so carefully and wisely. There can be situations where your child is in desperate trouble. And again, you say, if you want our house to be your halfway house, we will do so. But it's not going to be like life is great and you decided to live home to save money or something. It's going to be a halfway house in the sense that if you were to go to another halfway house, they would drug test you. They would keep you accountable for your time and your money. They would make sure you're working. And they wouldn't live you, let you live there unless you kept the rules. And so if you want our help, this is the way it comes. And because you're an adult, there's nothing compelling you to take our help. And again, what you have to do, and this is, by the way, in, in all of life, the, the one key decision is, what would be the thing I could do here that would most please God? as best you can tell. And there's not always an exact formula for where you come out with that, but that has to be the focus instead of your fears. Well, if I don't let her come home, she'll go back to the boy, bad boyfriend or she'll get even a worse boyfriend, so I'm going to let her come home and do whatever she wants. Don't do that. Um, in the long run, you're not helping. We already talked about uh, incorrigible children. Uh, there's a section in the book on financial matters. I would just say... Uh, danger, danger, danger. <laughs> uh, it can be good. Uh, help them get an education or vocational training to uh, prepare for adult life, but just sending them off with your money with no real plan is almost like sending the prodigal son off to the far country. Uh, whatever college you may choose can be the far country, so there should be a plan to go along with the help. And yeah, it, it, I think it's nice that instead of waiting you know, until you're dead to get an inheritance. If you have wealth and you can help them get established as a family or help them, you know, helping in the case of how it'll be used wisely, great. Or helping them in emergencies, great. Enabling bad behavior, bad idea. Which means you can't always give an exactly equal amount of help to each child. If you've got one child who's a missionary and one child who's an investment banker, you'll probably be helping the missionary a little more than the investment banker. If you've got one who's a crack addict and one who's a missionary in the same way. I actually was counseling a guy who was a meth addict and uh, a lady was helping me counsel, her father was helping me counsel this guy. And the worst thing that ever happened to him is he inherited $50,000. And he blew through that in a year and he damaged his brain where he's hearing voices. He never had access to that much drugs before and it just did nothing but uh, harm. Uh, another just little piece of advice is I think it's also good to be open about these things with your kids. There's a parable about it, right? Or a story that leads to a parable where the brother says, Let, make my brother share my inheritance. So this is a touchy subject. So I think just being honest with your kids about what you're doing at least gives them a chance to talk with you about it. Another really big topic I talked about, which I want to spend a few more minutes on, is courtship and marriage. Um, this has been a big issue... A lot of it within the homeschooling movement of which I was a part, I kind of joked before about how first it was courtship, then it became betrothal in some circles, and how do you make sure your kids marry the right person? Uh, how do you control it is really what it boils down to. How can you control your kid's choice? And again, you think about ideals, and you, when you're first here, you're expecting a daughter, and your wife's expecting and pregnant, and you're picturing the day when you're going to walk your virgin daughter down the aisle. She's finished her education. She's been pure, wonderful daughter, and she's marrying this great guy. He's got a really good job, and they're going to live about a mile away, you know, and in your neighborhood, but not too close. And his parents and you are really great friends, and all your church people are there, and they're just so happy for you. And you're just living the parental dream. And I, I'm sure some of you may experience things similar to that. I know people who have, and I'm really happy for them. But not all of us get our dream. And one of the problems with the many good things about some of the parental formulas, I mean, there are good things about the homeschool movement we were part of. 
But sometimes people make an idol out of that dream. And then, like James says, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? It says you had desires that wage war within you, and then you kill when you don't get what you want. And the problem will be is that, well, I had this dream, and now she's going to marry this other guy, or worse, or whatever is going to happen. And, I mean, it's hard enough to deal with the implications of what they may really be doing wrong, but especially if it's something not even your offense against what they may have done to God, but you wrecked my dream. And... Uh, on top of that, again, with, again, I'm not trashing the homeschool. If I, if I had more kids, I probably would homeschool them too. So I'm not against homeschooling. But within the movement, there were a lot of people saying essentially that you have absolute right to tell your kids who to marry. You have absolute veto power over who they may marry. And Gothard wrote about this. It was on his website when he had a website. Um, just that, you know, almost without exception... And again, that's nice. It's, it's great if all four in-laws just love the marriage, love the kids, all for it. Good for children to seek parental wisdom. I'll affirm that as well. That if you're courting, dating, uh, get your parents' advice. I've seen wise parents who have enabled their kids to avoid disaster in marriage by seeing the bad character of someone that the children didn't recognize. But by the way, the only way you're going to have that kind of influence on your kid, two things have to happen. Uh, one is, is that you have to have a relationship with them and they really trust you, a great relationship. The second one is God has to work miracles in their heart for that to happen. So it's great for wisdom to be sought and heeded, but we have to ultimately give those dreams to God. And so, again, so what authority do parents have when their kids choose, you want to choose a spouse, um, point one would be, if by this time you don't have your kid's heart, whatever authority you think you have is irrelevant anyway, they're going to do whatever they want. Uh, the only way you're going to have influence is if they really love you and trust you. And part of that is you're treating like an adult and not a nine-year-old. So you can't control it. You can say, I'm not coming to the wedding and I've seen these cases where the guy says, what do you mean? When she was 12 years old, I took her out on a nice date and I gave her a promise ring and she put it on her finger and she promised she would never, ever even talk to a guy without him talking to me first and getting my permission. And now she's about to get married. How dare she? And again, he's playing the lawyer. Like, I'm going to, you know, you made this promise when you were 12. Now you're 25. And I'm holding you to what you said when you were 12. And I'm sorry, every 12-year-old girl is going to bite on that, right? They're going to say, yeah, that sounds great, daddy. But they're not always going to feel that way 13 years later. And, and just trying to invoke the law and say, well, you promise. I've never yet heard of a case of, you know, Daddy, you're right. I'm going to dump this guy I've been with for four years because you don't like him. And I'm going to just trust you and keep looking at my promise ring every day when I'm lonely. Um, so... And parents don't have the right to impose marriage on their kids. 1 Corinthians 7.39 is an interesting case where you have um, a widow. It says, a wife is bound to her husband as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. It doesn't say to whom her father, her brother. It says to whom she wishes. And so... My understanding is that that choice ultimately rests with the child. And parents who try to be overly controlling are provoking their children to anger. And, and there are circumstances. I've, I've had many, many cases like this where, I mean, an obvious case would be a girl from Iran becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. And she wants to marry a Christian man. Are her parents ever going to approve of that? She will never get married. Her, she must obey God rather than men in terms of not marrying the Muslim guy her parents want her to marry. But then I've had other cases where you had a case of a guy, uh, a man who was actually a naval officer, and he was courting a girl. And he did all the homeschool stuff. I mean, went to the father. You know, he was a young naval officer just out of the academy, I think, and daughters just graduating from college. And he went to the dad and he told all about himself and he was accountable during the relationship. The relationship went on for a couple of years. They're approaching engagement 
And then the dad learns that this young naval officer who is courting his daughter is a five-point Calvinist. And the dad is a flaming Arminian who just thinks Calvinism is awful. And he just says, I forbid you from marrying my daughter. Well, the daughter's heart already belongs to this guy. They, they're this close to being engaged. I don't think he has the right to do that. I've seen other cases where the dad, again, the dad's pedo baptist and he thinks babies need to be sprinkled and the daughters become a believer's baptism person with her fiancé and I don't want my grandchildren not to be sprinkled. You can't see this guy anymore. That's not a biblical reason to stop people. It's not respecting their adulthood. Um, and it's caused great harm. Now, even in those cases, I mean, I've been involved in mediation trying to get, and I, by God's grace, had a successful case or two where we help the parents and the kids who want to get married to come to some kind of agreement where this can, uh, the marriage can take place. But anyway, I think it's ultimately that choice is going to be the responsibility of the child I know they're complicating situations. Um, but then now you get to the next point. Well, what do you do if your kid marries and they're making a choice you don't think is right, you don't like? And there are all kinds of variants on this. This could be, I'm not going to go a whole other hour, but you could almost take the case studies and, and fill the hour. <sighs> what if your daughter is marrying a guy and you just don't like the guy? Again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Do you think she knows by now? That's what you think? Just telling her how awful that guy is at this stage of the game is probably not going to help your cause. Um, it, it depends on the details. I mean, if he's a drug dealer or molester or something, you keep fighting. But part of it, well, maybe he's not a Christian. Probably he's not a Christian, you may think. Well, if he's not a Christian, probably she's not a Christian either where she probably wouldn't be attracted to this guy. And there are exceptions, but that's... Generally, she's attracted to what matters most to her. And so, you're probably dealing with two unbelievers who want to get married. Well, I'm not going to the wedding. I guess you're free to make that choice. I've had a lot of dads call me, and they're very upset because they don't like whom their daughter or their son is marrying. But just remember that what you do on that particular day is going to affect your relationship with your daughter, your son-in-law, and your grandchildren for the next 40 years. If you come to the wedding, they will still know you were not happy about this. Uh, but you can go and be gracious. And you, you can say, basically, if this is the decision you're making, we will do everything within our power to help it to work. And we will seek to love the person you've chosen to love. That's my take. Again, there are you could come up with a scenario where I might say, I'm not sure I could go to that one. You know, can you walk her down the aisle? You know, but I've, I think a lot of times people don't want to go to the wedding or they want to walk her down the aisle, not because they're convinced from the Bible they're not supposed to do that, but they're just so mad that their dream got messed up. Show grace where you can without compromising your standards. Now, people ask a lot, can you go to a homosexual marriage? What if your, your kid is going to do that? And I've heard Christians say different things, and that's where I can say, how could you say that? But in my view, that's not a marriage, and I couldn't in good conscience participate in that even as a witness because it's distorting what God has said. Mar marriage is a man and a woman, one man, one woman. And, but even then, that doesn't, you don't hate that person whom your child, it could be living with somebody, and be it in a fornication lifestyle or a homosexual lifestyle. Um, the problem with your child is not that they're immoral. The problem is they're lost. And what they need is not to cease being homosexual or stop fornicating. Their great need is to come to Christ. And when 1 Corinthians 6 says, neither fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, or will inherit the kingdom of God, such were some of you, and you were washed and you were cleansed. What they need is the gospel. Not... And sometimes we're just so ashamed of their immorality, we're tempted to shun them. There's nothing in the Bible saying you have to shun your kids. And you can even be kind to the person they're with. And you can say, actually, we had a guy from Harvest USA at school last week, and he was, you know, scenarios that come up is, can they come over? Yes, but can they, they might say, look, if you're going to be in our home, can you respect our home to disagree? You sleep in different rooms, or you don't show a lot of affection because we've got little kids here, and we don't, you know, we want a relationship with you where both can have to work at this. But 
do what you can within your conscience to have the relationship. Um, and again, probably in a room of this size, there's some of you going through stuff right now. And it's really, really tough. It tears you up. But just distinguish between what, where is it where I'm just, because my heart is broken, I just can't stand it and I don't want to be around it. And where is it that from the Bible, I just can't do this. Like for me, homosexual wedding, I just can't do this. But even then, I've done things and I would encourage others to do things that are really hard. There's nothing sinful about saying I will meet, I don't have a son who's homosexual, but if he had a friend, nothing saying is wrong for me to get to know them both and be nice to them. I'm, I'm, and if it was your next door neighbor, if you had two homosexuals next door, it probably wouldn't bug you to be nice to them. It's because it's your kid is driving you nuts. But the problem with your kid is not their morality, their problem is their lostness. Um, as I'm running out of time, I'll just summarize with a couple things. My wife has been a great help to me with our adult kids in kind of the never give up thing. I mean, now we're not at all in the control phase, but in relationship. I'll admit sometimes for myself, when I see unbelief or a lifestyle that doesn't please God, or even sometimes saying hurtful things. Our kids think we kind of messed them up by raising them as Christians. And they kind of missed out on all the good stuff worldlings get in high school and all that. Um, and some of the things were silly, you know, fighting tooth and nail over Halloween or something. Maybe some of you, that's the big deal. We never did it. I, looking back, I don't like it, but I don't really think that's what have ruined my kids. Um, so we, we can humbly admit, we know we made many mistakes, but you know, we, we tried to honor the Lord. And sometimes my temptation can be, even with my students, just to kind of like, I have sons in the faith who are flourishing. And I, I find joy in them. And Caroline is just so good about continuing to push me to keep trying, keep loving, keep calling, keep writing, keep using our vacation time to see them or invite them into our home and try to extend the grace and the love of Christ to them and the people they care about, hoping that God will use that. And that's been a great help to me. And kind of as I ended the last talk, that um, God is good to all people. You know, Jesus talks about that. He even loves his enemies. He causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And to learn how, you know, I hope many of you are enjoying wonderful circumstances with your adult kids. I'm sure some of you are. But for those who are struggling, as God every day causes his sun to shine and his goodness to go forth, even to those who are rebels against him, that God would give us grace and wisdom to show that love and that he would use us at some point to bring our kids to faith for those who aren't believing. And then to rejoice. God has helped me. That's another thing is that we were the couple who are married a few years and they desperately want kids and they've had miscarriages and now they, nothing's happening. And sometimes they would struggle when their friends are getting pregnant left and right. And I get that. And sometimes when I hear about like your pastor's son is leading worship and I'm happy. But God has helped me to be happy for those who are enjoying those blessings. I pray they'll come to us as well, but to rejoice in God's good work wherever we see it.